What's up, everybody, and welcome to the grand finals of GST Legends Game 3, winner take all, for the Gigabyte Esports Tournament held every month by Ghost of Gamers Fan and also being casted by Gods. Shouts to Gods and the entire Ghost of Gamers staff crew for putting on this Dota 1 tournament for all of Southeast Asia to enjoy. And I hear that SMM will be mostly Dota 1 per usual. So, looks like teams will practice up for Dota 1 in the near future. I wish it might have been Dota 2, so teams have more incentive to switch over, but still, we're going to see Dota 1. Dota 1 apparently will never die in the Southeast Asian, nor will it die in the Chinese scene. But still, this is a very, very action-packed Grand Finals. The first two games were pretty one-sided for the most part. Uh, Pacific Max managed to handle Neolution in Game 1 on the back of their Dirge Trialine, and their Dragonite, headed by Vivas, just worked so hard. But meanwhile, in Game 2, Neoshin responded with a very, very strong early game strategy on the back of the Batrider and the Templar Assassin pickup with the Dirge Trailing of their own. And meanwhile, Pacific Max were put on their back heels. Pacific Max clearly not expecting any sort of super aggressive strategy by Neoshin, and Neoshin really ended them very, very quickly in 22 minutes. So can Pacific Max recover? Because right now, Neoshin seems to have all the momentum. Morphling is the first pickup by Neoshin. And I'm not a huge fan of this pickup. Morphling, of course, did not have too much success in the last game. And Morphling with the first pick just indicates too much in your strategy. It just indicates, all right, we want to go for a bit more of the late game. We're going to keep a very, very sort of safe trying to get the Morphling farmed up. Um, probably headed by an Ancient Apparition or an Earthshaker, but Earthshaker is the man by Neolution. And he doesn't really provide too much. He has the waveform in terms of giving a lot of damage, and he has a lot of survivability, but still... Uh, he can be beaten in the early game. And will Pacific Emax, yes, they are going for an early game strategy. It's Beastmaster, a clear indication. As they're going to abandon the Dragonite, probably Beastmaster going to be soloing mid. But still, Dragonite might be an appropriate pickup. But right now, there are a lot of heroes still left in the pool. Queen of Pain, Puck, very, very standard heroes. Legathrope was not banned or picked in the last game. Well, he was banned in the second round of the ban phase. But still, uh, I don't really know if he's worthy of first pay ban in this particular scene. Of course, in other scenes, in the Chinese scene, in the Dota 2 scene, he's definitely worthy of that first pick, first ban status. But right now, he doesn't really seem to suit the Southeast Asian metagame. But Shaodim is the pickup by Nilushin Taji, heading that cabin slot. And will he go for another Barrier pick? Oh man, I'd love to see that happen. But Barrier, uh, he's not really very, very effective in Morphling Challenge, so he might have to solo it up. And of course, Barrier in the last game was in a challenge with the Dirge and the Rubik. And right now, they pick up the Windrunner. Windrunner, of course, does not get very strong until the mid-game. Does not have too much early game prowess. Needs a high level Shackle Shot and Power Shot in order to be truly effective. So Nilushin just going completely sort of the opposite direction in terms of their strategy. They want to go for the mid to late game. They want to get that disruption to save, to be defensive, to save their heroes in the tribe, get that winner, get that pipe, or get that mechanism for staff build to save their allies, get the morphing for sustained DPS. And meanwhile, Pacific Emax, they want to go for the beast. Master. They want to get that early game stun. They want to have more ganking prowess to their name. Maybe pick up that fast necro book. If he does go for the fast necro book, if he solos mid, I won't be surprised to see if he maxes inner beast by level nine. And if he does that, it'll be very, very difficult to stop the early game push strat of Pacific Max. But it's really going to depend on who's going to lane against the Windrunner. Will Windrunner solo the middle lane? Will she go to the bottom lane? It's too late to tell. Batrider is the ban. Milo looks like Neolution recognizes okay. Looks like Pacific Max, they still need one more support. What support would they pick up? Will it be an H9 version? Most likely. So they're going to ban him out. And who's left in support? It's pool. Looks like uh, Thrall is still left in support pool for Pacific Max. Um... But I do not see Pacific Max picking up Thrall. Only MSI Uwu GT seems to have an affinity for Thrall. So there's still a lot of heroes. There's still Crystal Main. Templar Assassin is Ben. They ban out two of the strongest heroes in the last lineup. And that might have put a, a crushing blow in terms of Neelish's strategy. Templar Assassin, a very strong mid-game carry. And she really, headed by Entrezzo, she did a dominant job against the side of Pacific Max. So that might have crushed the Neelish's hope. But Dragonite's still in the pool, as Leshrac is picked up by Neelushin. And if they have a very pushing oriented trial, and it might put Pacific Max back on the heel, but right now, who will they lane with their Leshrac? Will he be a support Leshrac? Will he be a sole mid Leshrac? It's going to be very interesting to see. Uh, I really, don't really know if uh, support mid lane Leshrac can outlane a Beastmaster, in all honesty. Uh, pretty squishy. Axes can handle themselves. Beastmaster innate tank ability has better damage to last hit. Diabolic Edict won't have nearly as much effectiveness because middle lane creeps reinforce much, much more quickly than the other lanes. So we'll see how they decide to use the Slash Rack. But Lash Rack, of course, a very powerful hero in his own right. So it's going to be interesting to see how the Neolishin squad from Thailand decides to use this hero. 
But I meanwhile, Pacific Max is thinking long and hard. They still have to pick up one more support. They still have to pick up their potential late game carry to head their trial. And they pick up the Weaver. He worked quite effectively in the game one. And right now, they just really want the Weaver to survive. Get some farm. He won't be very important. He'll probably be the most, the least important hero in terms of this game shaping up for the Pacific Max squad. He's just going to try to survive. Try to get this farm when possible. But just survive. Not give the opposing trial line too much gold. And did I mention to survive? I think I think I should mention that he needs to survive. Just saying. You know, Neelishan, they're thinking long and hard. Who will they be the last hero of the trine if they go for Lashak? Ah, uh, who's still in the pool? They might pick up a panda for some mid-game team fight. I wouldn't be too against that. Panda's still in the hero pool. Very, very strong mid-game hero. Can handle himself quite well against Beastmaster. So I would go for a panda quite personally. But still, it's going to be difficult to say. Of course, Dragonite's still in the pool. Will Neelishan take the bait and pick up the Dragonite? If he does, I would not like that pick up for Neelishan at all. Pacific Max just leaving that Dragonite in there just saying, come on. Go, take it, reach out and grab that Dragonite. He's been so dominant in this tournament. Go on, I know you want it. You just one more hit of that Dragonite, man. One more hit. But still, I do not know if Neelishan will fall to the bait of the Dragonite being left into the open. Uh, Pucky is still in the pool. Will they go for it? some long lane action with the Puck? May have Windrunner solo mid? Uh, Puck can fare reasonably well. One of the heroes who fares pretty well against both Weaver and Queen of Pain. And of course, Puck very strong against the Filipinos in general. Right now, Neelishan thinking long and hard. They're probably discussing their laning assigns, and just judging by the amount of time, I'm thinking they're going to have some unorthodox lanes. Just going to say. They might even employ dual lanes, for all I know. As I see a tide enter for the last pick, I do not like this pickup. Of course, they get the team fight lineup, but right now, if Pacific Max pick up one more early game hero, they're going to have so much damage. And of course, tide enter, ridiculously long cooldown, 152nd in terms of how long that cooldown will be. So they got to either run tide enter in a dual lane to get him a lot of experience so he can. Uh, get Ravage off as many times as possible, or they're going to run him in a trial where he won't get a fast Ravage. It'll be reasonably ineffective. Uh, Sand King's still in the pool, but Sand King, of course, uh, pretty garbage in the Southeast Asian scene. Uh, not in the Dota scene. Sand King, a very, very powerful hero, but just in the Southeast Asian scene, he does not work out well. Chris Main, the last hero, an aggressive support hero pick by the Pacific Max squad, and I really favor the Pacific Max squad in this lineup. I'm not really too sure what New is doing. They're playing it too safe. They won very decisively with a very aggressive lineup, but right now they're switching out to pretty much all-out turtle mode. Tired to with that Ravage. Uh, he's going to have to see how the shape of this looks like. Um, it's too early to tell, but we might see some dueling. But still, let's introduce the players and the teams. Pacific Max is a defending champion of GST June. Can they hold on to their title and bring the champion home to the Philippines? Or will it be Thailand or New Lucian bring it home to the Thai scene? As Inma is going to be playing that Rubik... Huggy Bear going to play that Queen of Pain. Beaboss going to play that Beastmaster. Don playing the Crystal Mane. And CHN playing the Weaver. Meanwhile, Taji is going to play the Lesha. KYT is playing the Windrunner. Uh, KYT always plays the hero that just does not have a good time in the long lane. But KYT is going to be handling that Windrunner. Nasism going to be playing that Shouty. And Bali going to be playing the Tide Hunter. And in Trezzle, the Morphling. And if there's one thing, I mean, in Trezzle, the last time we played Morphling on my channel, Hey, they won very, very decisively. He went beyond God, like, very, very quickly. So, Neelishan does have that going for them. As they're going to see a dueling of Tidehunter morphing mid. Or maybe Tidehunter is going to roam out. I'm not really too sure what Neelishan's really thinking with their lane. Uh, looks like they're going to have a dueling of Shadow Demon, Leshrac top. And they're going to be facing a try most likely, with Weaver, Crystal Mane, and probably the Rubik once he migrates that. Uh, Beastmaster should be able to hit himself. He's going for a very, very fast bottle build. I like this a lot. Only has to last hit probably like three or four creeps in order to get that bottle. And once he gets that bottle with the double courier, he's going to be A-OK -okay even against a dual lane. I mean, what can Tide Hunter do? If they had a ranged support hit building out the Morphling, it would be a lot better. But honestly, what can Tide Hunter do in this uh, middle lane? He's just going to provide a bit of harassment, but still not being a ranged hero, not having too many spammable spells to his name. He's going to have a difficult time. As it looks like Shadow Doom is going to be a lot of trouble initially. Telekinesis and the Weaver going to be Catching him in the trees, Tango's out a little bit too little, too late, as a Dawn, the Crystal Man, picks up the first blood. And we're going to see some couriers being upgraded, going to get ferry that Beastmaster his bottle. And right now, Beastmaster is just having a grand old time in that middle lane. You know, this top lane of Leshrac, Shadow Demon will not have too much fun. Leshrac and Shadow Demon, not very mobile. You know, we were very, very mobile. And of course, spells like Frostbite holding people in place, Telekinesis sending people back. It's going to be very, very effective against the squishy mobile heroes like Shadow Demon. And Leshrac, this top duel lane is not going to have too good of a time. And we see Beastmaster pick up an early level in a beast. Just going to give his lane a bit more pushing. Meal Tyler just going to drop a gush. Looks like this lane's working out a little bit more 
a little bit better than I expected, but the bottle has not been shipped out to the Beastmaster quite yet. So once he picks up that, you should be A-OK, -okay, only to increase, but still the gold over time will start to build up. You know, this bottom lane should be washed. I mean, usually whenever I say it's uh, Windrunner versus Queen of Pain or Windrunner versus Puck, I always say Windrunner should have the advantage, but then Windrunner inevitably feeds. I don't know why. She has a better attack animation. Maybe it's because she doesn't get an ultimate until later on. Maybe that's the reason, and we see ganks at level 6. I see Ball being shipped out to the Beastmaster, going to be bottling up. And now Tidehunter and Morphling are going to have a lot more difficult time. Morphling, not a bottle crow hero, as looks like Gnosticism does take the fall. Shadow Demon falling to the storm as CHN does pick up the last hit on the back of his Weaver. And this top try line going to be very, very effective for Neelushin. And Morphling's not a bottle crow carry, so he's going to either have to rune. Or he's going to have to ferry himself a lot of regen. Otherwise, Beastmaster is just going to have an easy time up against the Salute Lane. And Tidehunter, it looks like he doesn't really know what to do. Level 2. And he's going to need a fast level 6 to, in order to use his Ravage as many times as possible. Because uh, once the other team starts picking up BKV, starts picking up tank items, Ravage will become more and more ineffective as the game goes on. But still, in the early game, the power of Ravage cannot be understood as Axe's constantly keeping Trezzo back. He's not having a fun time at all. And Shadow Demon is going to do a bit of a creep pull. Can he get this level 1 camp to be pulled? Yes, he does. And he's going to just get some levels from that. As Shadow, as Tyranitar, a more tanky support than the Shadow Demon, going to help out Taji on that top lane with the help of the slow from the Gush. Well, Queen of Pain is going to be bottle crowing. One runner, um... 7-2 versus Queen of Pain, 16-1, my god, more than doubling up the CS and that's strength of bottle crowing. And you can see the strength of bottle crowing is just coming back, Morphling not having too good of a time, not picking up bottle crow, winner are not picking up bottle crow, and bottle crowing seems to be the way to victory in these tri-lane scenarios. Duane, I mean, Tadhunter, Duane mid was an interesting idea, but you're going to need a tankier carry, a Morphling, a carry who can hit harder in the mid game, sort of a gank carry are just heroes who can do more damage in the mid-game, like an anti-mage, like a Night Stalker. Morphling can't really do too much, and with a Tyrant to spawn in Tyrant, I mean, come on, Beastmaster just is not afraid of a Morphling Tyrant to try lane. Naturally tank hero. So this try lane situation, or this dual lane mid, I like the idea, but it's just not working out, as Morphling's force to strength morph does not have any mana to his name, picks up a bottle for himself, he's got to keep bottle curling it back and forth, and no bottle to help out the winner, and winner is going to have a miserable time on the spot on lane against the Queen of Pain. And right now, Fraud Nova is being dropped. Looks like Shadow Demon is going to be in a lot of trouble. As soon as he ventures back in the lane, Shadow Demon is just going to be in for a lot of punishment. Looks like Inma picks up the last hit on the back of the Rubik. As nicely done. 3 to 0 in favor of Pacific Max. Laning face being completely won by the side of the Pacific Max team. And the Ocean, they're going to be in a lot of trouble because they do have. Pretty powerful mid to late game in the form of Tyrant and Morphling, but still Weaver is nothing to mess with. But still supports like Crystal Man. I think uh, New Ocean does have the better late game, but this is just such a much further de departure from their last game that I'm really not liking their picks in this game. And Morphling is forced to use wave farm, not even to pick up any farm, just a wave farm out of there against the threatening roar of Beastmaster. And right now Roar is up, and Morphling's got to be very, very careful. Does have a lot of man to burn, but still you never want to ban burn all your mana on wave form. It's such a costly spell, and it can be so deadly in offensive situations that you really want to hold on to it as long as possible. You know, you can see Beastmaster picking up level 2, and he's probably going to max it by level 8, just to get that push up. And if Beastmaster picks up a very fast Necrobook, Necrobook will just melt these squishy heroes like Windrunner, like Glishrak, like Shadow Demon, and you can't underestimate the power of Necrobook in combination with the Inner Beast, as it looks like Shadow Demon might want to go on the offensive for Chris May. No, Soul Catcher just being dropped. But still, just going to check out the bottom lane farm. 33 and 3 compared to 16 and 4. She just now picks up the bottle. But they do do they have two couriers? No, they only have one courier. So that bottle is going to be <laughs> just forced. I mean, I guess the idea was they'd put a dual lane mid. As this ward is improperly placed. Cannot see this area. Uh, come on. Come on, Inma. You're a better support player than that. But I guess the idea was to have the dual lane so Morphling could pick up some runes as Weaver takes the fall. Sentry Ward scoping out the action. Of course, nice Soul Catcher combined with Split Earth and the Shadow Demon Disruption holding Weaver in place. As they pick up a kill on CHN, but still CHN I maintain. Probably the most useless hero in regards to the Pacific Yanks lineup. Morphling very, very low HP, baiting out Beastmaster Roar, trying to wave form out of there preemptively. But Beastmaster is just going to keep blasting, just controlling the lane. And I guess the idea of this was that Tidehunter 
would be able to harass a bit harder, or maybe they want to put the Shadow Demon mid. I'd rather have the Shadow Demon mid, just off the bat, as it looks like there's a huge gain on, on the top lane. Uh, Shadow Demon's in a lot of trouble. Swarm doing a lot of damage. His Weaver's gonna come in, gonna pick up one more kill. Shadow Demon's gonna try to draw the heroes away from the Leshrac. Leshrac is gonna scurry away. Meanwhile, all the while, it looks like Beabas teleports in with the Beastmaster, easily picks up kill on the Tyranter. Belt of Giant Strength might be for Chance, but most likely for a fast Necrovoke, as he's gonna keep Bottle curling it up, even if he sees a rune and no rune to his name. But I guess the idea, just going back to what I was saying, of this dual lane mid by the Neolution squad was just to get easy runes so that Windrunner can just use a bottle crow and Morphling can just uh, pick up runes to fuel his bottle, but Tidehunter not being a very powerful mid lane support cannot really do too much. And right now, Neolution are in a lot of trouble. Queen of Pain has 45 and 6 CS going for a null talisman, almost stalling out the Windrunner as she's going to bottle crow it up. As we can just check out the items for a short bit, as we can see, <laughs> I mean, much more, greater experience advantage in terms of Pacific Axe, two level 3 heroes on the side of the Ocean, Shadow Demon, and Tidehunter. And Tidehunter does need a fast level 6 because Ryo is such a long cooldown, you really want to use it as many times as possible, but you can't use it if you don't pick up a lot fast level 6. And of course Tidehunter not really working too much, working out too well in this game. Beastmaster picking up level 3 inner beast, so he is going to get it by level 9. Get that inner beast max before he picks up the Necrobroke, and that means he's going to go for fast Necrobroke. Or, before picking up his Call of the Wild, he's going to go for fast Necrobroke. And those Necrobroke illusions will hurt Ward going in, and the Axes. Queen of Pain just drops the Sonic Wave. Just to see the pretty fresh flashing lights. He's, she's like a cat chasing laser corner. Just wants to see the flashing lights kill that Morphling. Even though it obviously couldn't, as it looks like Swarm is being dropped, Crystal Man drops the Frost Nova, but the high levels and the amount of damage that the top trine is throwing out is just too much. Weaver time, no, pops a magic wand, level 5, as he's going to be able to escape just fine. No, he's caught in the middle of a couple century ward. Can he escape? Weaver is in a lot of trouble. Lightning Storm picks up kill. Taji picking up a double kill. Nice to done. Rubik's going to be in a lot of trouble. Can Rubik take the fall? No, Beastmaster comes in. Rubik does take the fall, but Taji's going to be in a lot of trouble. Here comes the Bia Boss on a vengeance. Wants to pick up another kill on Taji. Diabolic Edict not being leveled up too highly. Is going to die to a couple more hits by the Beastmaster. No, Beastmaster is going to be forced to run away. Can he get the last hit? Yes, Axes as Taji retreats to the trees. I'd rather just keep running maybe to the this side. But still, Beastmaster managed to pick up another kill. Here comes Crystal Main. Morphing in a lot. Joe Morphing is going to wave out. I'm offering all the while to strength, and, and every moment that Morphing's not farming is just a minor victory in, of it, in, if, in and of itself by the Physician Axe squad. I'm starting to sound like I was hanging out with them too much lately, guys. But keep in mind, uh, Bia Boss did manage to pick off that middle tier 1 tower, and this, middle, this top tier 1 tower, with the help of that attack speed boost, is going to be short to fall. Going to be soon to fall. My god, can I speak English today? Apparently not. But still, what's Neolution's game plan? They need to farm up the Morphling, they need to get level 6 on a Tyranter. Shadow Demon is pretty much hopeless at this point in game. 0, 5, and 2. And meanwhile, Queen of Pain having a huge advantage, 65 and 8, compared to the Windrunners, 34 and 6 on the bottom lane. And right now, everything is coming up the side of Pacific Max. Beastmaster is probably chipping a Necrobook level 1, or even Necrobook level 2. He's picked up a couple kills, picked up some towers. So it wouldn't be too surprising to see if he picked up a very fast Necrobook level 2. But Stone Necrobook is on its way to the Beastmaster. And right now, that's going to be even more damage and a fast Necrobook before tenants in the game. That will hurt. They will just do so much damage. Mana Burn can drain pretty much huge amounts of HP from heroes like Shadow Demon on Lesh Rack. Only saving grace is that Tashi picked up some kills on the top lane level 7. But right now, he's going to go for Null Talisons just to try to tank up as much as possible. Queen Pain being harassed a bit, but has that Battle Crow. It's going to go for that Perseverance and just try to regen as much as possible. Going to go for that Lincoln Sphere as well and just try to get that. Or might even go for a Bloodstone. Hey, anything's possible. Looks like there's a migration of Scourge Heroes. They tried to migrate down with the bottom gank of uh, Smoker Deceit, but still, uh, looks like Pacific Emax, even though they didn't have wards, they sensed something was up. And the Pacific Emax ward does scout out the movement of the. Neolution heroes, and right now they're just wasting three heroes' time where Tidehunter could be getting that level 6, Shadow Demon could be getting more experience, and all that accomplishes just wasting a lot of time by Neolution. And right now, Pacific Max looking very, very strong. Necrobook level 1 picked up by the Beastmaster, and he's working very rapidly towards that complete Necrobook. It looks like there's engagement. Weaver and Crystal Man came back to try to pick up a kill on the Shadow Demon. Meanwhile, KYT does fall in the bottom lane, but still, Weaver picks up an easy kill on the Shadow Demon. 
Level 3 Shadow Demon, not having a good time at all. And right now, Neelishin caught completely on the back foot. And this, again, I think this might be just a case of complete outpick by the side of Pacific Emax, or just complete outthinking, because I don't know if it was, it was a bit of outpick, but just out, the lanes did not work out. As Weaver going to get ravaged as well as Lightning Star, but still, CHN, probably the most useless hero on the Pacific Emax squad. He does not really fit in their game plans. He's sort of a last-ditch resort. And hey, if you're going to blow your Ravage on a single hero, that means we're gonna, we can feel free to take team fights whenever we want, because that Ravage will not be up for another 150 seconds. So we can firm up, we can go aggressively without any fear of your Tidehunter. Maybe even Tidehunter soul men without Anchor Smash. We see in Dota too often. But still, um, Leshrac, Tidehunter. Doesn't really fit in the uh, Pinoy metagame. At least not in tri lanes, or dual lanes mids, I suppose. We were going to go for a Perseverance, trying to pick up a Lincoln Sphere himself, but still. Again, it doesn't really matter what Weaver gets. It matters what the Beastmaster get. Negger Book level 1. Meanwhile, Rubik trying to get as tanky. Not too much iron progression by the side of Pizuku Max, so maybe they're not as far ahead as I suspected. Uh, just going to check out the hero goals. 10-5, to 5, they do have 3 more towers than Neolution, but still, uh, looks like they're not making too many more item purchases to their name. Queen of Pain, going to go f finish that as uh, the Courier is going to keep fairing that bottle curl, but right now the levels are just telling a whole different story. And if, uh, if the item progression by Pacific Max isn't too telling, just look at the items on side and Ocean. They don't have anything. They have some items on the last track, a little bit, a couple of Wraith Bands on the Morphling, on that Shadow Demon. Level 4 has three Ironwood branches to his name, one CS. My god. Talk about dirt poor. He's picking up smoke good seats whenever possible. Can they get gang off of this Queen of Pain Shackle Shot? Not latching on. As looks like Oshak is going to try to push in. Does she have, or does he have some levels in Dabal? He gets a stun off on Inma, letting Storm to fall, but wait for him to escape as Shadow Demon is going to drop some Shadow Poisons. One more Shadow Poison. If it hits, we'll pick up a kill on Inma. And yes, nice job by Gnosticism. Picks up the kill on Inma, hits level 5 and a bit. But looks like Morpheus is just going to teleport out of there. Going to farm up the mid lane while Weaver is pushing top all the while. But Beastmaster, with that Necrobook level 1, is just going to push in without too much regard for human safety. And it's going to be fine as Leshrac is taking a bit of damage on this bottom lane. Will Queen of Pain blink in with the Sonic Wave? Drops the screen of Pain, but looks like Queen of Pain does get Shackle Shot, might get Chain Stun. And Soul Catcher amplified by KYT's Power Shot and Split Earth, melting that Queen of Pain in an instant. So Queen of Pain not enjoying that whatsoever. 10 to 7 in favor of Neelishin, but just Bad Burn with their map control, with their split pushing, is just looking so very strong. And Morphing has to make a choice to defend the top lane or defend the mid lane. Mid lane's in great da greater danger, but top lane's easier to lane against. So it looks like he's going to migrate against top, try to pick up his farm 70 CS on Entrezzo. He's going to try to finish the Lincoln Sphere as, is, as soon as possible. Maybe even go for a fast mid to give them a little bit more pushing. I wouldn't be too against that. But still, Neelishin did a nice job in terms of stalling. Ravage is back up, so they might go for a team fight. Or maybe they want to get some more experience on the Shadow Demon. He's picked up boot speed finally. Poor Lonesome Shadow Demon. Just being hurt down in the prime of his life. But still, Pacific Max playing this very slow. They're giving up a little bit of their advantage, but still, it's going to come down to this Beastmaster. Necro 2 finish on the Beastmaster. Necro 3 will be up in about 300 gold. And once Beastmaster picks up Necro 3 by 16 minutes in the end, my god, that will just do so much damage. It will just really, really rip through the sides of the Neolution squad. Winrard is not even close to finishing Mechanism. Does not have any item components for that Mechanism. Shadow Demon, only 650 HP to his name. So, it's once Beastmaster picks up the Necro 3, Beabas will just be uncontrollable. And hey, Beastmaster as a semi-carry works pretty well in this scene, apparently. Well, we were just going to keep farming up, and Trezor's just going to teleport out. Going to try to get as much farm as possible in that middle lane. Going to probably go for the Lincolns. Uh, let's just check out his gold very fast. No, nope, saving up a lot of gold. Maybe he'll go for a fast Ghost Scepter into the Hero Blade? I don't know. But alone, the action is going on. Just checking out some of the wards. You can see a ward being placed by Neelishin. Uh, meanwhile, Pacific Max has a very, very offensive ward, seeing any teleports in if they want to get go for some ganks on the bottom lane. Beastmaster drops Roy as here comes some reinforcements. Waveform is stolen. He's morphing everything straight, but here comes Rubik and the waveform in by Rubik. How, how poetic.
Morphling was helped killed by his own spell by the waveform. As Vibus picks up the mega kill, is going to finish his Necro 3, and now this middle tower is definitely going to take the fall. Can the Ocean push the bottom tower? Weaver's going to do a lot of pressure to this top tower, and I mean, Pacific Max can just swing around to kill that top tower. And if they kill this top tower without the Ocean picking up this bottom tower, Pacific, Pacific Emax will just have so much more gold momentum going their way that will be very, very hard to overcome. But also, like, Reshrak. Looks like Leshrac picked up enough points in Dabalgi to, to help mow down this tower, but Glyph is popped. And here comes the teleport in by the Christmas Man, the most menacing teleport in. She is the one who knocks. Shouts to Breaking Bad. Morphling is gonna <laughs> go in, try to pick up his farm. After that death, he's not having too good of a time. Gonna try to finish his ultimate but it looks like it's some more ganks, some more maneuvering. No defensive orbs being placed, only this offensive orb being placed by Pacific Max. And Morphing might be in for a lot of toys. It's gonna wait for him out of there. Did, was it just debate? No, Beastmaster's is not getting in position. And Morphing is just gonna probably retreat. But here comes Gray, the Windrunner. She's gonna be in a lot of trouble. The board coming in, Rubik dropping the telekinesis. The illusions, unfortunately, not doing anything. Beastmaster himself was not in position. Shackle shot, latching onto the boar. But looks like Huggy Bear managed to pick off Taji on the bottom lane. As the top lane, Morphing is just going to wave out of there. So Taji, the Leshrac, the semi-carry was doing reasonably well. Just got a little bit more poor. The man's hitting, on, hitting down upon poor unfortunate Taji. You know, Crystal Mane, I guess they tried to dive for the Crystal Mane. And she just baited like an absolute champ. She knows, hey, you masturbate to me, I masturbate to you. You know, Gnosticism does die to Huggy Bear, the Queen of Pain, doing a nice job all the while. Still saving up a lot of gold for the Perseverance. Probably going to finish Lincoln's here very, very soon. Morphling going to get roared. Here comes the Necrobook doing out so much damage. Madrain draining all Morphling's mana. Picked up an early Ghost after Rubik goes in for the last hit with the Waveform. Looks like Morphling is going to go for a very fast Ethereal Blade, but that won't really help. I mean... Your, your agility is not really too high in this point of the game. I mean, it might help against the squishies like Crystal Mane, like Rubik, but still, it won't really help in terms of uh, preventing a lot of the pushing. But hey, I guess it's better than Lincoln Sphere. You do more offensive damage than you could possibly do by surviving with the Lincoln Sphere. Meanwhile, New Ocean just being absolutely suffocated. They have no towers to their name. Map control and complete advantage to the side of Pacific Emax, placing wards, placing Hawks. Just completely controlling all aspects of the map, and the only ward being placed by New Ocean is this defensive Roshan ward, and I don't even know how much that will help. That won't help them once the bottom tier 2 tower does take the fall, and it will fall very, very soon. It looks like Pazigi Max are probably going to set their sights on that tower very, very shortly. Blink Dagger being picked up that Beastmaster, very aggressive item, gets a long-range initiation to go in, and with the help of Queen of Pain blinking in, the target he's focusing will die in an instant. You know, Weaver gonna probably has finished the Perseverance. How much gold does he have? He has 3,400. Gonna probably save it for the relic. Uh, will yes, there is a smoke gank. Was it spied? I think it might have been spied by Pacific Emax, so Weaver might suspect something. No, it looks like Weaver does not suspect too much. As Weaver is gonna be a lot of Can they get the proper the proper chain stun up on him? Disruption. Can they time the split earth? Yes, they time the split earth. Night is done. Dust being popped, and Gush finishes the job. But still, Weaver has done nothing this game, and will continue to do nothing this game apparently as Queen of Pain is going to try to get some rest and going to pick off the spawn tier 2 tower and unfortunately they did use a lot of their time. New Ocean using smoke whenever it's off cooldown 14 and 8 they're making it a bit closer but still the gold, the map control just spells a whole different story as they're going to get a gank off on when our melts in the ins blink of an eye literally as we start to blinked in with the roar most likely and Medallion of Courage picked up the Crystal Mane as Anastasium does take the fall. And to step minus is our rig skill. Time to blew the Rage. Didn't even be able, wasn't even able to pick up a kill on Queen of Pain. And that's a huge victory for Pacific Max. That means they can push in without any fear of that Ravage. And that might have been the game coaching mistake. It won't be the game deciding factor, but that might spell the end for Neolution if Pacific Max decides to push in. Which they should do, because they have all their heroes up. They should have no fear of that Titan to uh, Ravage as any sort of reciprocation. Looks like Crystal Man picked up the Medallion of Courage, gonna finish off Roshan, and then push in. Tide Hunter Ravage will still be on cooldown by the time that happens. And everything is coming up Pacific Max. They're looking very, very strong. Might go well on their way to p defending their GST June title, as they're gonna be able to pick off Roshan. Unfortunately, Frostbite holding Roshan in place, making him scurry, dancing back and forth. 
and any impression being made looks like Neelis and recognizes they need to try to take this fight, but they don't have Ravage, they don't have any form of Blink Initiation. Meanwhile, uh, they do have Beastmaster War Initiation, they have Blink Initiation on the form of Beastmaster and the Queen of Pain. Shadow Poison dropping for the site, but still Neelis cannot accomplish too much. Here comes Queen of Pain blinking in, can she pick off Gnosticism right off the bat? Looks like Weaver picks up the Aegis more. Here comes Leshrac as Tachi picks up a kill immediately on Dawn. Beastmaster is going to retreat, but Morphling being dropped to the ground. Necrobook doing so much damage, Taji is the next one to fall. And the buckler is popped. Roar is being popped on the Windrunner. Windrunner will be the next one to fall. Bali dies soon after. Can't even pop the Ravage, because guess what? He didn't have Ravage. And Trezor picks up a one star revenge kill, but still trying to morph his way out. But still, power shot, screen of pain, amplified all the while by the Ghost Scepter. CHN picks up a triple kill. He's cackling to himself. Picks up the Lincoln Sphere instead of going for that straight relic. And picks up a triple kill. And now, with the Aegis of the Immortal, he has no fear. Tired to Ravage still has 40 seconds before cooling down. There's going to be a teleport in to defend this top lane. And Pacific Max are looking so very dominant. I do not see, honestly, any way for Neelishin to come back. Still, anything is possible in Doe. You definitely see crazier comebacks in the past. And you can't underestimate the power of a Tyrant to Ravage on the, and the strength of a Morphling. But right now, it's looking very, very grim for Neolution. And Weaver is going to just try to keep farming it up. You know, Biabas did die in the midst of all that. To the Morphling is just going to try to tank up, saying, I'll never die again. Never in Dota at all. I will never die again. Going to paint 3,800 gold in the bank. Probably going to go for a Mystic Staff. Might even go for a Relic, because hey, why not? He scouts out the double damage rune. We'll probably go on the offensive very, very soon. And right now... <laughs> Smoke and Deceit popped again. Can they get any sort of gank? Queen of Pain with the Lincoln Sphere will be very, very hard to kill. And right now all the heroes are migrating. Can they get a jump on with the Ravage? If Tyrant Dimensions is getting magical Ravage, it might spell the comeback for Neolution. But still, Pacific Max are very, very tanky. It'll be difficult to kill them. But still looks like Neolution are going to try. Can they get Initiation? Here comes Tyrant Shackle Shot just completely lifts. Here comes Raj, catches two hero, three heroes. Solo Catcher being dropped on the Weaver, but not going to do too much. Freezing Field being dropped all the while. Challenge looks like Tyrant is going to be next one to follow. Three more kills picked up by Pacific Max. And Winner is going to be shortly to follow after if they can get any sort of follow-up damage. Yes, Boar slowing all the while. And we Windrunner is going to be next one to fall. Looks like Biabas is going to do some body block pathing, or path blocking with his body. And four more kills picked up by Neelishan. Looks like Swan Swan is the call by Pacific Emacs. Boom! Headshot. But still, Morphin gonna farm. Knows that this game is pretty much lost. They can just push into the top lane, just expecting the good games. 5 5 5 is the call by Neelish and Trezo. That is not GG as some friendly banter uh, exchanged back and forth between the two teams. But it looks like the GEST title will remain in the Philippines. For the fourth consecutive month, MSI UGT won two straight GSTs and looks like Bad Burn, aka Pacific Emacs, follow up with two more straight GST wins. And keep in mind, as this game is very close to over, 5-5-5, uh, five, 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 I don't know what that means. Might just be some spam. Or it might just be uh, some like Filipino letters, I don't know. It's still Windrunner, gonna be the next one to fall. Can they get any sort of blink? Yes, yeah, Shadow Strike, Fade Bolt. In mud dominating. GG is called by Neolution. So that's gonna end that game. Thank you for watching GST July. If you want to check out, I made an entire playlist, I think nine videos of GST July. My god. <laughs> that's a lot of game matches I casted from that. And what's even more surprising in the GST August is literally in a week and a half. I honestly don't know how much I'm gonna cast of that, guys. I will definitely not cast nine matches. I don't even know if I'll cast three matches. But still, if you keep subscribing, keep spreading the word. I know there are a lot of Southeast Asian Dota 1 fans out there. So if you keep, surprising, keep subscribing, keep supporting me, uh, keep spreading the word and helping out, I'll keep casting Dota 1. But um, right now, I might take a little break from Dota 1 until at least a week and a half for GST. Uh, there is an interesting game up on Dota 1. I might cast Seb for Myth Trust. I like Myth Trust a decent amount. But that might be it for, in terms of Dota 1 for the near future. But still... If you keep supporting me, keep subscribing, keep following me on Facebook. I have no choice but to cast out one. So, 
keep supporting me all the while. Big shout out to Dice Smiling, what a boss, helping me out, spreading the word of my channel for GST July. And hopefully uh, you'll stay tuned in, but that's going to end the GST July. Hope you all enjoyed that. Uh, it was a very, very interesting tournament. Not as many close games as I would have hoped, but still some interesting Dota being played nonetheless. We saw a bit more adaptation, we saw more dual lanes, we saw more interesting picks, we saw the power of Puck. Or at least the inaction of Puck was not too effective in GST July, as he was in the MSI Overdrive tournament. Uh, Dry and I just ripping through the... GST July. Dirge making a huge comeback was seen in three games, I think. So thank you all for watching as usual, and have a fantastic night.